Today's text is Matthew 19, 35 through 38. And Jesus went throughout the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. Then he saw the crowds. He had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers in his harvest. The verse that begins this morning's text is a wrap-up of Jesus' ministry. I'm just going to read it again. It's verse 35. Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. If you would go back to chapter 4 in Matthew and look at verse 23, you will find the same thing said again. At least in the structure of Matthew, these are bookends and they're telling us something about his teaching. But these are summaries of what Jesus is all about. And I think we take it too lightly. Yeah, that's what he did. He's out there teaching. But just think for a moment. He proclaimed the good news of the kingdom. The only kingdom that these folks would have been familiar with would have been the kingdom of Rome. That's the kingdom that had military power all over the, the uh, Palestine and all over the place. They had uh, their troops all over their kingdom. Uh, we, every Easter, you know, we have a cross, we have a cross here. Uh, as Jesus was growing up, he would have been seeing crosses all over the place, not neat ones like that. They would have bodies hanging on them because this is how Rome would tell the people it's ruling, don't step out of line or this is what we'll do to you. That's what crucifixion was back then. So when Jesus hung on the cross, it wasn't that it was something that was new. This was the way Rome or the world took care of folks who stepped out of line. So Jesus is preaching a gospel of the kingdom, but it's not a gospel of the kingdom of Rome, but it's a gospel, the good news, because if he preached about the kingdom of Rome, that's not good news if you are the oppressed people living under the military rule of Rome, especially a people who have a history of being free, and now they're not free, and they are still living in the hope that there will be a day when they are no longer in exile, and they are a free people governing themselves. The gospel of the kingdom is the good news that God is not done with them yet. The gospel is the kingdom of the kingdom is the good news that God has not done with either you or me yet. The gospel of the kingdom means that God is not done with America yet, or England yet, or any country on the globe. The gospel, the good news is that there's something coming that no political formulation can, can be better than. There's something coming that God is doing that will actually fulfill us, heal us, complete us, and give us a life that we could never have imagined or structured on our own. But just so you know, that's dangerous preaching, especially in his day and time. But he wasn't just proclaiming this. It wasn't just words. There were powers behind it. Because it says he was healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Imagine that. Every kind of disease and every kind of sickness in a date and time where, quite honestly, maybe they would put leeches on you to try to heal you. There were no hospitals back then. There were no surgeries. Or if they were, I wouldn't have wanted to gone under the knife. No, so Jesus, in the gospel of the kingdom, is demonstrating something about the power of the kingdom as he heals every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Now we know that not every person who had a disease and every person who was sick was healed, but everybody he came into contact, he would make a difference in their lives. He was proclaiming a good news of another kingdom. 
and it was received by many. But we have to understand that because he was healing and proclaiming that ultimately the news, the good news wasn't about something out there. The good news was about him himself. Jesus was the good news. Not just was the good news, he is the good news. Still, he is the good news. It's through Jesus that something new is happening. It's through Jesus when you come into relationship with him that your life is changed. It's through Jesus that we get a new vision for ourselves and what's wrong with us or what's right with us. And we have the means to then make some course corrections. It's through Jesus that we receive the power to live a new life. He is the good news. He is the one healing. All of this swung on his presence. God was doing something new through his son, Jesus. And Jesus obeyed his father. But that was not his only motivation because we see here that Matthew tells us that Jesus saw the people and he had compassion on them. Have you ever had compassion on someone? And has it ever gotten so hard for you that you have to make a decision? Do I maintain this level of compassion, but it's tearing me up, or do I just find a way to kind of get hard? It doesn't mean I don't want to care about people, but the compassion part is killing me. Have you ever been there? Maybe not. Maybe so. The compassion killed Jesus. He saw the people and he was distressed about their plight with the ability, to, and he had the ability to do something about it. We know from the Gospel of John, let me just quickly step out of Matthew, we read this, we all know this verse, I believe. God so loved the world that he sent his son Jesus. God had compassion. Jesus has compassion. The Holy Spirit has compassion. And you and I as Christians, we have to have compassion. We're in the family of compassion. To do the mission of God, to represent the kingdom of God to the world, it must be done through compassion. Compassion recognizes the humanness of the other. When you're compassionate, you see the person for who they are, not who they should be, not who they could be. You just recognize that's who that person is. And Jesus loves them, and he's telling me to love them. In fact, I think what compassion does is it makes the person that you don't see into a human. Someone who has a face and a name. I was talking to Char this past week, and she related this amazing story that I just, I sit, sit there, I mean, Bob, honestly, I'm like, okay, how long is this story going to take, right? Yeah, <laughs> you've been there, right? But she's out at Walmart, and she's getting hungry, so she goes, this is a while back, and so she goes into the sandwich shop, uh, the Subway sandwich shop, she gets a sandwich. She noticed this old lady over here to the side, bent over, trying to work her walker or something like that. So she goes over and starts this conversation with her. And then through the conversation, she ends up doing her shopping for her. And then after she shops for her, she drives the lady home because instead of making her wait for a bus. And then she helps her get the stuff into the, this woman's house. She's never met this person. And then she's sitting there after she's put the stuff in the house, and she says, well, do you want me to put it in your refrigerator? No, i got to clean out my refrigerator. Well, you know, there's all, she notices there's paper all over the floor. Well, would you like me to vacuum your living room? And she says, no, no, I don't want you to vacuum my living room. But she starts picking up all these pieces of paper. The point is, she noticed this lady. She had Compassion was the driving force in the ministry of Jesus Christ. But in this instance, it was their desperate condition that caused him to have compassion upon them. 
is described in this way, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd in 936. If you've lived any length of time, you know that the world is not a nice place. It has beautiful scenery because it is the creation of God the Father. But there are many things that aren't right with the world, and we've seen it this week as we've seen a number of shootings. I don't know how you can see, hear that news without saying, uh, what has gone wrong? I met with my foster care review board members, uh, many of them who are no longer on the board. There are two who are still there, plus the leader of the foster care review board. And we were talking, and the state you know, is trying to cut its budget. And one of the things that's easiest to cut is the budget for these kids who need special services. And there are places that are closing. And the question is, where are they going to receive the services they need? Uh, who's going to step into that gap? Um, there's only two foster homes in our city that can take placements at this time. There's only two foster homes in all of Dubuque. There's more than two kids that need a foster home. The world is not a nice place. And what's clear about verse 36 is that you and I, people, not just back then in the first century, but even today, are indeed harassed and helpless. We are all like, uh, we are like sheep without a shepherd. Sheep need someone to guide them. They don't really function real well just hanging out by themselves. They have a tendency to get into trouble, to eat the wrong thing, to drink the wrong kind of liquid, to fall off a cliff. If one of them leads them, they all go. Uh, they just don't work real well without someone leading them. And in the Bible, whether it's Israel or it's the church, you and I are sheep and we don't do real well on our own. We need a shepherd. And while I do have to function as a shepherd, we also need to make sure that Jesus is our shepherd and that we're all looking to him for the guidance that we need. The shepherd wants to lead us to green pastures, but we want to go to brown patches. That's who we are. But he wants to have us lie down by quiet waters, but you and I want to go to the mud puddles instead. He seeks to have us on paths of righteousness, and we seek paths of peril. We're exciting. We are a harassed and helpless people, and we need the Lord. Amen? Amen. So then Jesus changes the metaphor as he points out that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. The fields are overflowing with wheat, but there aren't enough laborers to get the job done. That's not a good thing. I had a Presbyterian friend who was a pastor in northwest Iowa, which has a lot more agriculture going on, not much else. And one of the debates he had is during harvest season, do people come to church? Because you've got to get the harvest in. And me being someone who grew up in Pennsylvania said, no, you got to be in church. Because all I do is eat the stuff that farmers harvest. I'm not part of the goal or the job that's required. I don't realize that you got a limited time to do it. I don't know what the answer is. That's not the point. When the harvest is ready, it needs to be brought in. And Jesus is saying, it's, it's ready, folks. It's ready. But we don't have enough workers pray to the Lord of the harvest for more workers so the disciples and today's Christians are told to pray that and I find it interesting that he doesn't say go recruit people for the job why didn't Jesus say that hey I need to find some people let's get a plan let's get a sign-up list let's do something about this issue no he says you need to pray to the Lord of the harvest or laborers. I don't like this as a pastor because as a real, I mean, I, got, I want to be careful. Please don't overemphasize what I just said there. Because then again, Jesus points us to the fact we are so dependent on him. We can have strategies, all kinds of strategies to accomplish all kinds of things. And can I say again, I don't believe God is against strategies, 
But what he's saying here is if you want the harvest to come in, you need to find laborers, and it's not going to be you walking up to people and saying, hey, would you like to be a laborer for the harvest that's coming in? No, i got to go to God in prayer, the Lord of the harvest, and he will activate people. He will activate people. So I think in our minds, or at least mine, recruitment's more fruitful. We target someone to get going. We have an active part in the recruitment, and we're getting something done. But prayer on the front end of the process appears to us to be less fruitful. It's kind of, dare I say it, comes across as kind of like wasting time. I would never want to say that prayer is wasting time, but sometimes we get so energized about seeing something happen that we skip the prayer and go right to the task at hand and say we got to get something done. But maybe while in prayer to the Lord of the harvest, this is what could happen. God might just tap you and me on the shoulder and ask, well, what's wrong with you? What's your excuse? Why are you bugging out on this task? You just gave me a list of people that, Tim, or whoever, that you say, these would be great people to work in the harvest. How about you? I'll talk to them. But right now, I'm talking to you. How about you? In our world today, in the United States, only 26% of Christians believe that they have a responsibility to evangelize others. In our country, which is an amazing place to live, because we are a nation of immigrants, we have the greatest ethnic origin diversity of any nation in history. 31 ethnicities have a population of over 1 million in the U.S. of A. Out of that whole, about 60 to 70 percent self-identify as Christians. That means that about 30 to 40 percent of our population still need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of the kingdom. Not in an abusive way, not in a harsh way, not trying to trick them, but they need to hear the story of what God has been doing since the beginning of history. The harvest is plentiful, and the laborers are few. And we as a church need to pray to the Lord of the harvest for laborers and be prepared for him to maybe say, and how about you, good and faithful servant? So in our text, Jesus answers the call and he picks his 12. And it's clear that in Matthew, these 12 represent not just 12 people, but this is a new Israel. This is, this is the 12 tribes encapsulated in 12 individuals. That's why 12 keeps coming up. Jesus is doing something new. He's reinventing something based on what was old. You can't put new wine in old wineskins. Something new is occurring. And the movement will be the new representative of the kingdom on earth. And it only happens through Jesus. But note the way the disciples or the apostles, meaning sent ones, are named. First, there's Simon, who is called Peter. Andrew, his brother. Then James, the son of Zebedee. And John, his brother. Then Philip and Bartholomew. Then Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. Then there's James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus. And then Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Notice that they're all teamed up. I got Doc over here who teaches over at UD, and I got to do this. Students love team assignments where you've got to group people together. How would you like to be in Doc's class, and you got Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot on your group, and your grade depends on it. I don't want Judas on my team. It says he betrayed him. Simon the Zealot? Talk about radical. That's what a zealot was. That's a, we don't know how that worked out, to be honest with you. We know. <laughs> but evidently, they did some awesome stuff. They're teamed together. And I think that Jesus is setting a pattern. And ministry is not to be done in isolation. I'm not saying it doesn't happen in isolation. But I think the ideal plan is it's done in cooperation with others. This is the early church in these 12 people. Some of these apostles have absolutely no history of. I mean, you're reading, you're like, who the heck is that? All we know 
All we know, well, James, Thaddeus, what do you know about Thaddeus? I don't know anything about Thaddeus, so I went to seminary, but that doesn't mean anything. Okay, I'm not claiming anything on that. I mean, we know Peter, if he can put his foot in his mouth, he will. But he did many other great things. But what if he's telling us in these 12 that it doesn't matter, honestly, what you accomplish in regards to whether you become famous for it? What if it's about just being faithful with what you have? Because we know in this world, with so many Christians, not everybody can be famous. And we know that some people who are famous probably shouldn't be. It's just the day-in, day-out faithfulness of proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. So as I was meditating on this text, here's a name that came to mind. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. Leonard Dober. How many people know about Leonard Dober? He was attending a church meeting in Hernhut on July 23, 1731. So I don't think anybody in the room has met him. He heard a report about the horrible conditions of slaves in the West Indies. So what does he do? Right then and there, he resolved to offer himself as a missionary to these poor enslaved races. So after a sleepless night, Dober opened his Bible on the morning of July 24th, and this is what he read from Deuteronomy. I hope you find this intriguing. It says in Deuteronomy, For it is not an idle word for you, indeed it is your life. And by this word, you will prolong your days in the land which you are about to cross the Jordan to possess. That's Deuteronomy 32, 47. Make that your life verse, by the way. I don't know that it means anything to me. But on that day, in that context, it was an affirmation from God. I'm going to the West Indies. And I'm going to be a missionary to the slaves there. On August 21st of 1732, Dober and another man by the name of David Nitschman departed on the mission. They reached St. Thomas on December 13th, 1732. The island had been in the possession of Denmark for 50 years and had over 50 tobacco plantations with slave working on them. By 1732, thanks to the importation of slave labor from the Gold Coast of Africa, St. Thomas had become a thriving port with a number of small, carefully cultivated estates, which produced things like indigo, sugarcane, manioc, millet, sweet potatoes, and all kinds of fruits and herbs, in addition to tobacco. Before they arrived, the spiritual needs of the colonists had been taken care of. All inhabitants were obliged to attend, I lift this word, obliged to attend services at Christian's Fort each Sunday under penalty of a fine of 20 pounds of tobacco. Don't go to church? You better get 20 pounds of tobacco up to pay for that. Bob, you think that's a good idea? I don't know. Anyone who worked or allowed his men to work on the Lord's Day, day became liable to a, a fine of 50 pounds of tobacco. But when it came to the slaves, nothing had been done for them. That was unimportant. Most of the whites cherished a comfortable belief in their own predestined inheritance of heaven, together with considerable indifference as to the future of any other man, white or black. Dober and Nitschman had their work cut out for them. To identify with blacks required great moral courage. It involved social ostracism as a matter of course or worse. Whites had no real way of spending time with blacks who were working day in and day not at night, basically segregated from the general population. Their goal of evangelizing these slave populations was almost impossible because they couldn't even get into the fields with the slaves, and they had to work all different kinds of ways, and there were all kinds of barriers to what they did. In June of 1734, Tobias Leupold and 17 other missionaries arrived on St. Thomas. Some would continue the work of Dober that he had started, while others would move on to St. Croix and other islands. Dober would return after a year and a half to Europe with the first fruit 
of that mission. An orphan boy they had purchased by the name of Carmel Oli. He was baptized the following year in Ebersdorf and received the name of Joshua. Dope left no other actual converts, but today there are Moravian churches all through the West Indies because of their listening to God's call and going to an impossible situation and then finding nothing but frustration and then the first fruit being someone you actually bought and then gave freedom. But that started the ball rolling. One last thing is Jesus calls his disciples. He gives them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal every disease and every affliction. They're to proclaim the kingdom of heaven that it's at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. Doesn't that sound scary to you? Doesn't that? I was talking to my Greek Orthodox friend on Friday. I saw, you know, so... You know, heal the sick. Well, you know, Christians are, have been at the forefront of medical knowledge, of the creation of hospitals, of places where healing can occur. There's how many St. Peter's hospitals or St. Luke hospitals or mercy that come from the Christian idiom? How many are out there because of what Christ is, how he has moved people in the church to create these hospitals? But how do you deal with raising people from the dead? And my Greek Orthodox friend, Sacramento, says, well, isn't that what you do when you baptize people? You literally raise them from the dead. They go under, they die, you bring them up. Okay, that, that sounds good, but I don't really think that's what Jesus is talking about. I think what's going on here is that Jesus is telling us how hard this work is. It's not just about convincing somebody of one little point, and while they're here, now they're over there. Now I like Jesus. Or, you know, Jesus is in my universe now. He wasn't over here, but now he is. <laughs> I, you know, I let him in. I think what he's saying is, when it comes to moving people from here, I don't know Jesus, oh, he's cool, or he's a great teacher, to there, Jesus is the Lord of my life, requires the power of Jesus to get him there. You and I can never convince someone enough to give up their hopes and their dreams and their values to follow Jesus. There's just no way we can educate people enough. If Jesus isn't in that, we can maybe get them to budge a little bit. But ultimately, it's the responsibility of Jesus to do that. That's the power of God. And it's demonstrated that it's no little thing by the fact that he's giving people the, the ability to raise folks from the dead. This is impossible stuff. I can't raise anybody from the dead, but Jesus can. So if I'm doing ministry, and I'm, doing it, I'm trying to get it done through my strategies or my efforts or my best thinking, and again, I'm not saying those are bad things, but if I'm leaving the Lord of the universe out of this, I'm going to fail. Or the fruit of it isn't going to be real. Is Jesus in it? Paul states in Romans that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everybody needs Jesus. Notice in this list that there is no middle class regular people. <laughs> Sick, you know, harassed. Where's, where's the middle class person who's basically a good citizen, pays taxes, uh, good family people, doing the best for it? Where in that, did Jesus never go to them? Did he tell his disciples, skip those folks, they don't need them? Well, there is a verse that says, the doctor has come to the sick, not to the healthy. But if you read that verse carefully, you'll know that the healthy think they're healthy, but they're really sick. So they don't, they just, they're like most men who don't go to the doctor until it's almost too late. I learned that from a promise keeper. We're all sinners. We're all broken. We're all diseased. We need Jesus. That's just what the Bible says. That's the good news of the kingdom. You might not think it's good news. But it is. We all need the grace of God through Jesus Christ to become what he originally planned for us to be. So the work of discipleship and the proclamation of the good news of the kingdom 
is a God-originated, God-empowered, God-anointed task that if we attempt it in our own, is doomed to failure. The world is worse than we can see it. The world is more beautiful than we can see. And we need Jesus in all that He is as we attempt to do the service of God our Father. We need to pray for compassion. We need to pray for workers. We need to pray for authority. We need to pray for our place. We need to recognize what is going on in our lives and those around us. And only Jesus can heal us and them. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. If nothing else today, Lord, we need you. We need you. At our best, we need you. At our worst, we need you. And in that in-between space, we need you. We need you this week as we walk through our lives, as we do the things, Lord, that you have gifted us and we're really talented at and it almost rolls off our tongue or our hands just do it because we're so good at it. Lord, we need you and all of that. Or it becomes us doing it for us and not for you. Some of us are really afraid of doing anything for you. We, we have a history of being told we're screw-ups and we're not good enough. We need you. Because you don't look at us that way. You have compassion on us. And you see us in a way that we can't see ourselves. And in your power, you can penetrate and make us whole. Some of us are lonely. We need you. We need you to tell us we're not alone. You are there with us and you love us. Some of us are never lonely. We're always around people, and yet we are so lonely because the people we're around, it's just a facade. We need you. We need you to go dive deep into true relationship, true community, true reconciliation. We need you. We can't do this without you. Lord, we believe, help us with our belief. Help us, we need you. You have a task for us. Lord, we need you to do the task. Help us with the task. Lead us in the task. We need you. We thank you that you're there. We thank you that you will come through. We thank you that you are faithful. Thank you that you love us. We thank you that you're patient with us. We thank you that you will help us navigate this life. We thank you that you will make our church whole. In the name of Jesus, we pray this morning. We all say, Amen.